Hey folks, Kevin here. Well, it's June 26, 2018. I'm out in the uh, first food forest. I'm at the about the southernmost end of it. You can see the solar panels uh, to my uh, right there, and uh, or to the right of the screen to my actual left. And uh, behind me are two rows of uh, raspberries. Uh, we grow lots and lots of raspberries. I have several different ro rows. And, uh, and, and there's different ways that I've been dealing with trying to keep the weeds back. Uh, in some of the, the uh, perennial gardens, like the blueberries, in a previous video I, I hopefully have posted by now, I show that I've used the black weed mat to uh, help get the blueberries established and not let too many other plants invade. Um, so what are some other techniques I've used? Well, I've used wood chips as well, lots of wood chips. And, uh, and all of these are, are mechanisms that I've employed to try and find out just how effective they are, how much work is involved in the systems. And, and I know where I ultimately want to be, and these are just stepping stones to get there. The wood chips really help me to maintain the moisture around the plants. Uh, they pr provide a, a very good environment for perennial plants with the high fungal content as well, building the soil. However, it's not where I want to ultimately be. Uh, it's necessary at this point because we have some very uh, tenacious weeds such as quack grass, bindweed, and so on. And so using these, these means helps us to build soil potentially sequester carbon, uh, decrease evaporation, decrease water needs for irrigation as well, and thereby decreasing the amount of work that I have to do weeding. But as I get busy and the systems, uh, as I slow down and there's no <laughs> slowing of the systems that I'm working on, uh, the, some of the, the perennial gardens suffer. and. I have a, a the, the, the ultimate goal is ultimately to use more perennial plants, to use perennial companion plants, if you would, comp uh, perennial ground cover plants that are native to this area or that do very well in this area, that also have other benefits as well, so like the white clover, like there's white clover on the ground behind me here. Uh, the seed is ex is very expensive. White clover and bird's foot trefoil, which tend to do pretty well here, uh, when I've gone gone to buy it for to trying to get the uh, seeds really the plants established in the areas that I want them in, uh, it's cost prohibitive. So I'm using these other means for now, and trying to find ways that I can propagate more and more of the plants that I want, such as the white clover and the bird's foot trefoil. However, uh, it's probably wise to show you, I'm gonna stop right here and show you another spot. So hold on just a moment. Okay, I'm on the north side of the, uh, as you can see, the solar panels behind me. And this row here are um, uh, red raspberries. And we, we use these, bare, we're really into our perennial plants here on, on this site. And uh, we established this bed, was our first bed of the res red raspberries, back in 2012, so six years ago. And they have produced so much, this one bed has produced more than what we need for a year. However, my goals ultimately was to, produce multiple, was to be able to produce multiple folds of what we're going to need and to maybe, maybe make you pick gardens as well. Uh, but they'll be up front or out back, depending on how everything works out with providing the right perennial ground cover. But with this plant here, I use lots of wood chip, lots of compost, and all the plants did have done really, really well. Uh, however, the quack grass has made its way in as well. I didn't get the clover established like I had liked it to uh, get established. So I need to explore other perennials in combination with the white clover. Again, I need these plants to be really low ground cover in order not to impede the, uh, the growth and development and the actual productivity of the perennial crops that I want to be able to harvest. So uh, let's take a look at another spot. 
So uh, here I am up in the uh, second food forest. There's a large compost pile that I just recently uh, uploaded a video on. And uh, this is a long row of raspberries as well. Uh, and it's pretty darn thick. I didn't get a chance to prune it last year or this year so far. I took the mower up and mowed up against the edge of it. However, there are several different plant species, weeds and grasses that are growing up into this. And I, I really was thinking that, wow, I think I can create an, an optimal uh, use of, the, of these plants by putting them right next to a swale. So right now I'm standing in the base of a swale. However, this swale gets fairly deep as it goes around the corner up here and heads to heads. Uh, so right that, that direction is north and it actually ends up going quite a ways west. So it follows the contour of a roadway, goes around where the grapevines are. And, uh, and this is one of the soil harvesting systems. So I really didn't think through the process very well because harvesting from the other side of the raspberries is pretty darn easy if we can keep the weeds under control. But with the swale systems, uh, even though I made it wide enough so that my uh, six foot wide mower can work its way down through there, it isn't a smooth uh, working system because this is a soil building system swale. And so soil gets much deeper and when it gets wet, you know, I get four, six inches of really good mucky type soil in here and then I have to wait until it dries up enough so that I can use the mower in there. So that didn't work out. So some of the weeds got a good foothold. So I really, the area needs to be fairly fat, flat wherever I'm gonna be having a you pick uh, berry uh, system. And it has to be so easy access. It's, it's an, a situation where people aren't gonna get their feet wet. Uh, they aren't going to twist an ankle because it's on an, on an angle and they aren't going to have weeds up past their, their ankles or up to their knees anyways. So this is a system which I, how I employed the system, it, I really didn't think it out that well. So ultimately all these raspberries, and there's probably a couple thousand plants in here, or at least a thousand plants that I'm going to have to pull out and go to another location. But I'm not going to rush it because I really have to get that ground cover thought out as well. Let's go see another spot. Okay, I'm over here just to the east side of the dog run. The house is right over there. And you see these plants behind me here. Well, that's all spearmint. And, uh, and that's a nice uh, perennial ground cover. However, it's a pretty darn tall plant. It's probably in the next two weeks this is going to go to flower, but it's probably almost three foot tall and it's pretty hardy. It doesn't fall over uh, real easy as well. The good thing about placing it here was I could go right up alongside of it and keep it mowed down so that the driveway stays, stays pretty open. And uh, some is actually over there along the canal margin as well. So it's pretty tenacious as far as making its way around. So the mints, there aren't too many mints that I can think of that are really low enough ground cover. And I learned that the hard way. Before the spearmint was here, we had blueberry plants. Those blueberry plants that you've seen in one of the other videos, uh, we had them planted all around the outside of the, uh, the dog run here around the house. And it was fantastic, really easy to, uh, to maintain, very easy to harvest. And, uh, and it looked fantastic, especially with the fall colors as well. However, I learned the, the hard way, if I'm going to put in a, a perennial plant to, to complement the blueberries, I need to pay attention to the height and make sure that it doesn't decrease the amount of sunlight getting to the leaves uh, requiring photosynthesis. So let's look at one other plant that I think is important to uh, consider. Okay, I'm over here near Pond 3 now, and we have some flower beds right here. And there's another plant. I'm going to turn the camera out so you can see it in just a second. Uh, but it's chamomile. Now, it gets a little bit taller than some of the other plants. And that's one of the things I would encourage you to actually try using these plants on your site before you actually go full tilt boogie and, 
and purchase a whole bunch of the plants and put them all over the place. My goal is to be able to propagate these plants myself after establishing just how well these plants are actually uh, performing the way that I want them to perform. And again, the, each one of these plants, including oregano, is another plant that we have over in the West Garden. I won't go over there right now, but you've seen that in the videos. That gets about the same height as the chamomile. But these, these also are, have other functions. Uh, we can use them for our teas, use them for medicinal purposes as well. So these plants provide multiple functions besides being a ground cover or a companion plant for other species. Uh, there are other companion plants that we've been using for years, the, the garlic, the chives, the, uh, uh, the horseradish, the uh, comfrey, all of those, but they get too tall for the function of, of being a, a ground cover around some of the other garden plants that we want to plant into. So these are plants that, that, that ultimately will be the ground cover plants for other perennial plants that are the main crop, but these give a secondary or tertiary crop as well. But the most important thing that, that these plants do is they create, they build soil, they're self-mulching, so it takes away the need to be mulching or fertilizing. They're creating uh, the optimal environment if we choose the, the appropriate ground cover plants they're creating the microbial, the, the soil microbiome community that supports the primary plant that we're putting out there if it's a U-pick garden and all, so that we don't have to use any chemicals, we don't have to use weed mats, we don't have to be out there working our tails off to support them as well. So that's a project, this is where I'm headed in the future and I just wanted to share that with you because you may see me moving plants from place to place and definitely sharing with you some of the big mess ups that I've made. I'm gonna turn around and show you the, uh, the chamomile. Now these were all started this spring. They were started last year from seed and I grew them in a couple of areas. Uh, here I'm seeing how well they tolerate being in, in the shade as well. And they're doing pretty darn well. Well, now I'm over here uh, just behind Pond 5. I'm actually in the shade right now. And behind me is the outdoor, one of the outdoor nursery areas that I created, which the deer got into and destroyed and all. But uh, this is an area that uh, I'll post a link in the upper right-hand corner where I showed that I was, I was saving the blueberry plants from, from the ravages of the spearmint where I planted them uh, around the outside of the dog run as I already mentioned and I mentioned that the spearmint got so tall it overtook the blueberry plants. So I took the, the blueberry plants out. I tried to pull out every bit of the roots uh, that, that I have all that vital energy of the spearmint plants but I didn't get them all out because the ones that were on the side of the building where all the spearmint was, well there were those tiny little roots overtook the, uh, the blueberry plants again. So now they're completely engulfed in spearmint, uh, spearmint, the blueberry plants are engulfed in spearmint plants. Uh, some of the other blueberry plants that I saved over here, uh, you know, they're doing okay. This, er this area hasn't been irrigated for quite some time. Hopefully this is still working. <laughs> and we'll take a look at just how, how uh, invasive the spearmint actually is. So right here, these are all blueberry plants, and it, they're just totally uh, uh, engulfed by the uh, spearmint. And down in here, there's some creepy Charlie, which uh, doesn't stay just as a ground cover. Uh, it actually will climb up the plants just like bindweed will as well. So in amongst these blueberries here, there are, <laughs> here we have the creeping Charlie. And here we have some quackgrass and the, uh, uh, the spearmint as well. So I'm going to try and get to the points that I want to make about this. Over, over the last couple of years, the videos that I've been posting, it's pretty evident. I really like uh, the weed mat fabric, uh, the staples holding it down. It really reduces a lot of the labor that we have here. 
uh, from some of the videos, you're probably getting an idea that, man, I'm crazy about wood chips. I, have, I get all the wood chips I can possibly get. They really help me to build soil. I can sequester carbon. I can reduce the amount of uh, moisture that, that the plants need. They help to retain the moisture as well. So those things are absolutely fantastic. But along the way, I've been experimenting and trying to see well, which perennial plants can I use to help out in, uh, with, in multiple ways so each plant will provide multiple functions and meet multiple needs. Enhancing the microbial community in the soil is one of the most important needs. Sequestering carbon is another important means. Uh, decreasing evaporation, decreasing the, the need for watering the plants. Uh, it, providing other resources such as making some of our herbal teas, making me medicines as well. And being great for bringing in beneficial insects for the gardens and for the food forests. Uh, being good for the bees to be able to have the pollen and the nectars that they need. It isn't just one plant that we want. We want to have uh, an interaction between multiple different plant species. Not just the nitrogen fixers, but also some of the herbs as well. So I hope this video was uh, informative, inspiring. I'd like to see more people uh, sharing their experiences with the various plants and mixing them together. Uh, there's a small group of plants, where is it, right over this shoulder here, where I've taken lemon balm and the spearmint has go gone up in it. And I'm letting those two fight it out and see what happens. And it appears that the lemon balm is actually crawling taller to try and compete with the, uh, with the spearmint. They both have different means of uh, setting out the roots and accomplishing a takeover of a, of a, of a small little uh, geographic spot. And it's interesting to see. And I think that's important for us to share our experiences and video record it, show these experiences, talk about the, the, the soil type that you have, the amount of sun exposure, the amount of uh, moisture that you're getting as well, so we can all learn from each other and experiment further. Uh, there are many other different perennial ground covers. And if you have some suggestions about the perennial ground covers that are really low to the ground, uh, I'd like to hear about them. I'm mostly interested in the uh, cold, temperate uh, uh, region like we're in, in the uh, central, uh, upper New York, upstate New York, central New York area. So if you found this a value, please give it a thumbs up, share it at will. If you'd like to hear more of these types of videos, please uh, hit the bell icon to be notified when another video is posted. And by all means, folks, have a fantastic day. Bye-bye now. Thank you.